Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, as you know, at Policy Punchline, we've been doing this special coverage called Aspiring Intellectuals, where I uh, bring in some of my uh, favorite public intellectuals and scholars and ask them very fundamental questions from uh, philosophy to political theory to genetics. Uh, and today joining me is Professor Stephen Keltz, who is a lecturer at the Politics Department and University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. He is leading a freshman seminar this coming spring semester titled Money, Markets, and Morals. Uh, so he does a lot of work in political theory of money. And um, very recently, as many of you must have uh, been reading about in the news uh, or watching on TV, uh, there's been a huge story about the stock GameStop uh, and also the uh, related scandals or conclusion, uh, collusions or mark market manipulations uh, that are being alleged and thrown around. And, and uh, some people say this is a proletariat revolution. And some people say that the bourgeoisie of the uh, Citadel Securities and Robin Hood are uh, manipulating markets and such and so on. So there's so much to unpack on that front. Um, so I asked Professor Kels to join the show and we'll gradually unpack not just the incident itself, but also uh, many of the related political theoretical implications. And we'll go back all the way to John Locke and we'll talk about Milton Friedman. What's it, uh, what it actually means to have a regulated market, a unregulated market, a self-regulating market. What are the uh, moral history of markets uh, and money? So Professor Kels, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Tiger, thanks for having me on. I'm a, I'm a big fan of policy uh, punchlines, so I'm glad to be here. And I've been reading what you write about uh, about this Reddit Wall Street bets fiasco, and uh, so really interested to engage with you. Absolutely. So maybe we can start just unpacking the incident a little bit from your perspective. Uh, what, what actually happened, just for our, the context of our listeners, uh, GameStop is this video game retailer that maybe many of you have never been to. Uh, it, it used to be very, a, a big, <laughs> well, a big deal during uh, kind of my time when uh, I was a teenager. A lot of my friends would go to those, literally go to those stores uh, in those malls to buy those video games. But the stock hasn't really been doing well over the past few years because everybody everything's moving online and especially not doing well during COVID. So the stock for a little bit of context was around 15, you know, $17 uh, this Jan early this January. Uh, it, ro it rose to around $43 by January 21st. Uh, it, it, it went up to around $150 by January 26th. Uh, and then $350 by January 27th. Uh, and then basically went up and down uh, between $200, $300 uh, around that time. And today, as we are recording this on February the 2nd, as of market close, the stock actually dropped 60%. So now it's down to $90 as of markets close. So huge swings, huge volatility. You can hear tears falling all across America, Dagger. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> It's literally just uh, such a volatile stock. And some people have been shorting it. Some people have been lawning it. And it's just a, such a confusing story. So uh, Professor Kels, maybe we can talk about it a little bit from, from your perspective. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that um, one of the interesting things to, for us uh, to chat about would be the ways in which uh, normative or ethical judgments are sort of flying around fast and fast and furious. Um, because all of the parties to these uh, transactions actually seem to believe that they were wronged by unethical behavior of others, either collusive behavior or um, unethical behavior in, so, in some other way. And I think like you were saying, if we unpack this, um, uh, this incident, it'll raise a lot of the questions that I actually uh, investigate historically by looking back a couple of centuries and seeing the genealogy of the change in these uh, concepts. So let's maybe you and I go back and forth a, a little bit about what different, you know, uh, potential players in the current uh, controversy are saying and what sort of claims that, that they might be, they might be making. I should have, I have a niece who uh, is on that uh, subreddit and she and her husband, I think, invested in uh, GameStop and AMC and some of the others that, that had the same effect happen to them. So I guess you could, you could sort of start there. So it, it has been interesting to me that the claims that they make about uh, uh, being wronged by, by non-market behavior, 
right? So they're using these apps, let's say Robinhood, Webull, there are others where folks are doing the investing in these um, stocks. And there, as you know, I, I don't have to uh, explain it to you and probably many of the people watching this, I just think it's useful to go through some of the, some of the claims. There, there were, they were buying the stock long, investing in the stock long, uh, but they were also buying options in it. And, and at least in the case of uh, Robinhood, you could finance those options if you had a certain investment in the app, you had a certain amount of money sitting there in, uh, in the app. Right. Now, they believed when, many of them believed that when, I believe it was last Friday morning uh, in particular, when Robin Hood sort of turned the spigot down, um, it turned the spigot off uh, first on them actually making further purchases of, uh, of the stock, turned the spigot almost entirely off also on them financing option calls uh, on, the, uh, on the stock. They believe that there was something collusive going on. There was some anti-market behavior uh, going on there, and different people pointed in different directions. As as you know, was there collusion between the big hedge funds that were now losing money on the short sales? Right. Everybody pretty much knows the story now. But as you said, um, Marvin Capital and then later Citadel, which had had purchased uh, Marvin Capital, they owned a bunch of short positions. Uh, in 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 these in stocks, stuff, yes, yeah, and I believe that the technical term was they were taking a bath. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they were just getting <laughs> killed on these short positions, and oh, of course there was, in some sense, a near near perfect correlation correlation between the money that was being lost uh, there and the money that was being gained by these traders. At least that's how these traders on these apps saw it. For every for every dollar that was being lost over here a dollar was being gained by them. And if the spigot was being turned down, their direct access to gains uh, was being turned down. And I know that, that you've written about this uh, problem as well, and you're suspicious of the, of the suggestion or the-, or the um, Insinuation or the direct attack. Yeah. Or... That that is the unethical or uh, non-moral sort of non-market behavior that, that they were engaging in. So why don't you talk about your suspicion? I'm, I'm mostly interested in the way that in which the charges have flown fast and furious. So let's see what, what your response to that is. I think it's an interesting one. Sure. Professor Kaz, I, I think I didn't uh, do a very good introduction at the beginning because basically so much has unfolded because initially it was just seen as a crazy thing that somehow the Reddit users, as you said, who are all on this page called Wall Street Bets, which is, you know, in, in itself a very gambling kind of name, uh, they all shorted, uh, they all longed a, a group of stocks like AMC and, and, and GameStop that forced a lot of the hedge funds to go under. So I was at an economic conference last Tuesday and there were some very big name Wall Street chief economists and hedge fund ma uh, managers. And they were all saying how, uh, in, in some sense, people feel like the hedge funds were under attack. It was, it, and, and my friends and I were joking about how this was a proletarian revolution. And, mm -hmm. but, but that was all kind of fun and games until what happened was when Robin Hood, as you said, stopped the, uh, started to, to stop or, or disallow uh, the users from making trades on those. At least to meter users. their access to those trades. You know? Basically, they're, they're yeah. saying in the statement, they're saying we are restricting transactions for certain securities, uh, including you know, AMC, uh, Nokia, GameStop, uh, be because they basically were raising margin requirements for those securities. And they, their, their claim was basically saying we want to help uh, customers to stay informed. We want to protect the consumers. So to a lot of people, this seemed to be a very paternalistic view, which is like, I'm just doing, okay. I, I am literally, as you said, uh, making money. I am destroying those hedge funds. And now you are telling me that you know better, even though I am beating you at your mm -hmm. game. So that was when when the, the actual kind of explosion, I think that the public opinion exploded, which is when uh, Barstool Sports uh, founder, Dave Portnoy, uh, 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 AOC, Ted Cruz, um, basically people across the political and media spectrum all came out and people, said- People who wouldn't go to a cocktail party together. Exactly. All started <laughs> retweeting each other. Yes, yeah. Yeah, for, you have the libertarian <laughs> side who is basically saying, you have to let people do whatever they want. And you have the consumer protection side saying, you, you cannot just screw the, 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 the retail investors like that. So everybody yeah. was, was mad at this. And, and 
as, as you rightly fully pointed out, what Robin Hood did was seen as fundamentally more serious. You know, you are mm -hmm. essentially bar barring users from making profits in a free market and protecting yeah. those hedge funds because the correlation seems so perfect. And my personal yeah. suspicion was that uh, it is much harder for Citadel to pull off market manipulation than the public thinks and much easier for Robin Hood to have simply made some very stupid decisions in terms of mm -hmm. uh, corporate management. So yeah. I, I started off my uh, Substack uh, newsletter. I basically sent an email newsletter to my followers every morning. And, and I was saying that we, we think institutions and politicians make very rational decisions. So if they do something stupid or out of the ordinary, it must be some kind of conspiracy or coordinated effort to advance their interests. But, but that's often not true, right? Because we see powerful people making stupid decisions every day where the payoffs are really not worth the, the risks. Like when Trump lied about his inauguration number, uh, when he enacted the Muslim ban, or when he simply refuses to wear masks in the public. I mean, these are very sort of small time, um, small time uh, decisions that are not really gonna make advance any advancement towards his dream of MAGA, but will actually uh, pose in, in, a huge amount of risk in terms of public opinion. And I think the overarching framework from my perspective was that people make stupid decisions all the time. And I think it seemed perfectly clear from Robin Hood's perspective, which was, oh, we, we, we think that the regulators might be on our ass right now because so many people mm -hmm. are doing those volatile trades. Uh, we might have a liquidity issue because uh, we, we, they have to have a certain mm -hmm. amount of capital requirement with SEC and other regulatory organizations. Um, they, they were thinking that they don't want to pose any systemic risk. They don't want to catch any regulatory wind. So they preemptively shut down the trades, thinking that this would be the right move to do. But it turns out it's just a stupid decision. But, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, for, for Citadel or for any financial institution to have actually pulled off market manipulation, it would actually be very hard because we all know at the, the regulation, the compliance system at these financial institutions are very, very strict. I mean, every employee's text messages, emails, uh, chat messages in their Bloomberg terminals, everything is backed up and can be subpoenaed at any time. So I'm not saying there's zero likelihood that something shady went down. What I'm saying is if market manipulation and insider trading actually did happen, I'm pretty sure the SEC could find paper trails behind it because it's so hard to coordinate you know, between hedge funds and between teams and actually pressure Robinhood to do something and then actually make this happen all under the public spotlight without being caught. I mean, th that seems to me to be a very low likelihood uh, event. And that's why I, I was very suspicious. So if, if I had a, you know, a whiteboard in back of me, I'd do the kind of professor thing and I'd start actually sort of categorizing arguments we looked at, right? So there's one, uh, on the one side of that um, ledger, might be the sort of non-market explanations for this. And we've actually looked at two of those and those could be the paternalistic uh, argument and the collusive argument. Some of those traders on Robinhood thought they were being uh, treated paternalistically. They thought Robinhood was saying, we're doing this for your own good because if you buy in at 440 or whatever it reached uh, at one point, we're fairly certain it's gonna return to 40 and uh, won't be good for you. So that's the paternalistic argument. The other argument, of course, being the sort of collusive uh, argument that Robin Hood was in cahoots, as a, a student of mine said, in cahoots with um, Citadel and in some way coordinating to save them. They had just purchased, uh, folks know this, but they had just purchased all these bad bets that Marvin had made. And one way in which they could now sort of cash in on that purchase was to make the bets a little less bad for themselves for instance, by metering down the number of Reddit people who are buying this stock and driving its price up. So that's a collusive approach. Over here uh, though, on the, the, the hypothetical whiteboard uh, would be market-based explanations for it. And so I think in one way, your argument is there was still a properly functioning market here, but idiots engage in markets too. And even people who become very rich can be idiotic. Yes. And so the CEO and the other decision makers of Robin Hood may well fall into that just, just made stupid market decision. Right? Yes. But that would mean that there was still a functioning market uh, in place. Yes. Right. Whereas these others would say there had been ethical, ethical violations so serious that perhaps the even system is broken. The system is broken. Right. Like we might fundamentally think different, fundamentally different worldviews on, on what, how the system is operating right now. Yep. 
where we might might think that if SOAR um, products were pulled off the market for people thought to be incapable of them, we might say, well, that's not even now a market society. It's I see. it's not a market out on this. I happen to live near a commercial area in, uh, uh, in the town that I uh, live in. So pointing out to these stores, well, they're not even really engaged in open or free trade. They are not free markets if they are deciding what to sell to you on any other characteristics than those say of age for cigarettes or obscenity or uh, something along those lines, right? So we, on, you know, again, on that side of the ledger, we might say those behaviors actually undermine the market. I, I do kind of wonder about one of your arguments though that you made, uh, especially about the collusive behavior. I think a figurative wink and a nod can sometimes be enough. Um, yes. Robin Hood, as, as you know, and many of the folks listening to this will know, um, they processed, they, they are not themselves technically a market maker. Uh, and so they processed their trades, many of them through Citadel, not all. Um, I don't think it took a genius. To, to, yeah. If they were tr trying to engage in some sort of collusive behavior, I don't think it took a genius to figure yeah. out on one of these days that they could do a, you know, you scratch my back type of, yes. type of situation by saving Citadel without anybody having to communicate even a damn thing. Um, yeah. And I'm, I, I, I'm not yeah. saying that that's what happened because God, I don't want to be sued. But, um, <laughs> but in terms of potential explanations, right? I don't believe that we'd have to find the records that you're talking about in order to actually so, believe that there had been something shady, inappropriate had, collusion, had something it. shady there. I, I agree, Pro Professor Kelt, I guess I, I wasn't trying to imply that if you cannot find any evidence, that means nothing happened. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's other ways to get it, yeah. And, and I think what you were getting to was a larger point, which is that one could say there's a somewhat of a collective subconsciousness governing the financial system or the Wall Street establishment such that it does not take them to get into the same room in order to make the same decisions. And that's what a lot of people are saying about uh, whether it's the uh, tech media complex or, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people say Facebook and uh, Google and all those platforms, they didn't ban Alex Jones because they got together with a bunch of democratic politicians. And then they said, let's ban Alex Jones. They banned mm -hmm. Alex Jones because they genuinely all somehow collectively feel that he is a threat and we all just need to do it together. And so it, there was nothing actually colluding about it, which I, I yeah, I, I totally see what you're saying. And, and, and this, you know, for, for market ideology, as we're gonna talk about later on this call, creates a big problem. What if the market players that are supposed to be in competition with each other, all of a sudden, because of an, a, of an instantaneous and extremely odd set of social circumstances around them, all find their interests aligned? I see. They can make they can make these decisions, which essentially block a, a fully functioning uh, market. They block other people's entry into the market um, in ways that don't actually require uh, a lawyer or an economist to see the ev type of evidence they're looking for. Right? Yes. Like I said, I think we can get you know we'll get back to that uh, later. Like, what are the assumptions behind the mar market theory, um, such that th this incident presents a huge challenge for it? The other challenge I want to throw, uh, throw in here, since we're sort of cataloging different sort of challenges that we might think about in terms of the ethics of um, markets, is the role of the clearinghouses, I, which as soon as, struggling to get my words out there, sorry, uh, as soon as Robin Hood started doing this, I started thinking about what the clearinghouses must be, must be doing to them. And there's some significant evidence that they really were... Um, responding to demands that had been put on them by it's called Depository Trust and Clearing uh, Corporation. Okay, so the, and I have, you know, this is not in any way to exonerate Robin Hood for what they did, but to say that there's a, maybe a different moral argument to be made here. So folks who are listening to this call are gonna know how these clearing houses uh, work after a, a market maker makes a trade, um, right? Robin Hood, in a lot of these instances, would have turned to Citadel. Citadel had a bid-ask ratio for these uh, things. If the clients of Robin Hood uh, were willing to, to generate the price, uh, right, willing to give the price, then Citadel would would, uh, would finalize the transaction. 
But as we all know, that doesn't finalize the transaction now, does it? Because it's got to go to the clearinghouse and that's that T, po T plus two um, system. T plus that, three, that, yeah. 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 So it takes a couple of days uh, to actually make sure that there's a counterparty to seal the deal and actually make the transfer in the appropriate legal and properly financed way. And when you think about depository uh, trust, especially in the regulatory regime that they're under, under Dodd-Frank post uh, the 2008 financial crisis, here's uh, this account for, for Robinhood making essentially one type of trade only, right? There, there were very few people who by those days were like, hey, I'll take the short side on this, right? So they're making one type of trade only, they're booking one type of trade only, and it's coming in through these retailers in particular. It's very difficult to find a counterparty because there's nobody going through another bank who is wanting that short side. Yeah, when it started to go up under the 300s and 400s, certainly people were starting to look at put options and short side trades, and uh, et cetera. But for a time, there were very few. And the risk for de depository uh, uh, trust is getting extremely high at that point, that they won't be able to finalize a trade at the agreed upon price. They won't be able to find that uh, counterparty volatility uh, in the stock or a sudden drop in it, which everybody expected was coming, was going to make things just really very difficult to them. And I don't disbelieve the CEO of Robinhood when he said that the, that the request, it was for a couple billion dollars. I think it was to, it was to up their, uh, their margin by about two, three yes. billion from whatever yes. it was. They had to go up to three billion. And he was like, we don't have it. Yeah. Um, we just don't have it. That's not their business there's, model. They don't hold that much. They cannot hold that much cash. Yeah. And there's, there's people out there saying that, you know, the, the secret of this whole uh, thing, uh, Kamath Palapataya is, is out there saying that this, the real secret of this whole thing is that Robin Hood went out of business that day and nobody's admitting it, right? Because it couldn't yeah. make margin on trades. Uh, yeah, that it, it couldn't fulfill the margin, call, the, the, the liquidity requirements. It could have just really gone under. Um, it's, <laughs> in a way of thinking about it, it did go under momentarily. Yes. It was under. Um, and it's just nobody pulled life support. Um, and by a couple of days later, as folks have read, they had a billion dollar raise. And I think that actually became two and then three billion. And they raised another 2.4, I think. Yeah, yeah 2.4. Another 2.4. So it's 1 billion. I think another, either another 2.4 were now become 2.4. I need to read up on the numbers. Yeah. A lot of chatter, as, as they say. Yes. So um, there were... <laughs> You know, you could think of Robin Hood as sort of having gone under at that uh, moment, but then of course it really didn't go under because there are a lot of investors who are like, mm. <laughs> despite the controversy caused, they can see the power of what this app and this business model is going to be. So they kind of rescued it as it were. But, but what I see in there, and let me tell you if, if this argument makes any sense to you, is still a market um, and a set of market institutions that close rank, closed ranks around itself. And that definitely protected the larger investors from the smaller investors, but did so in a way that we might approve of because those increased margin requirements post 2008 financial crisis are meant to protect the system. They're in, in protecting from systemic risk. The system has lots of big guys and, and not as many little guys, when you just invoke systemic risk, you're necessarily saying you're gonna protect the big guys fr from the threats, uh, uh, the threats that occur because of trades uh, like this in a volatile uh, environment. And so something ethically relevant happened, this is another hypothesis, something ethically relevant happened, but it was not, it did not undermine uh, the market. It in fact saved the market. Professor Kaz, I guess just to clarify for our listeners a little bit, because back in 2008, what would have happened would likely have been uh, that clearinghouses had very, very low capital requirements for meeting those margin calls, uh, essentially allowing players like Robinhood to make uncovered bets and expose the entire system to systemic risk. So 
Yeah. What today we're seeing is almost the dramatic opposite, which is that we really want you to make those margin calls. Please make those margin calls. Get your liquidity. And, and but but this is the 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 precise the opposite reason how uh, the, yeah. you know the quote unquote the system is rigged. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So th so that we we should so that we should be talking about the way in which the market rules here were constructed. And that includes the liquidity requirements, right? We absolutely should be talking about it because when that rule got written down, it was set in stone. It was fate that somebody in the near future was gonna get screwed, that the little guy was gonna get screwed by big, bigger banks being protected. But I'm trying to point out here that America consciously chose that in the wake of the financial crisis. It was an ethical decision, but it I was see. a market-based decision. It's, it's possible to see that as saving markets while at the same time to criticize the ethics of markets behind it and to say, we ought to revisit that choice. Um, I see. P Professor Kass, actually, before you told me about the 2008 a clearinghouse example. And I, I imagine for a lot of our listeners, it might be their first time uh, learning about this instance, which is that, you know, back in 2008, this uh, a completely different set of circumstances would have unwinded and would have probably actually threatened uh, the, the safety of many, many investors in the name of, you know, free markets per se. So it's not that we want completely free markets or that we don't want free markets per se. We, mm -hmm. It's that people want, markets to be regulated in a fair way, it seems. Like. Because we often look at 2008 and we say, that was capitalism run amok. And we look at today, we say, it is still capitalism run amok, uh, but also they're pressuring the small guys to give in and they're, so it, 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 it always yeah. seems to be something going on. Right, right, yeah. I like that way of putting it. it, it it's still capitalism run amok, but what else would you choose, right? That, that could be a conclusion from that way of looking at it, right? Like you're gonna have to tell me how you would set the liquidity, liquidity requirements such that in future incidents, um, it's not necessarily the biggest players that get saved. And yet systemic risk isn't so over the top that we see uh, uh, big, big players going under uh, like they did in that uh, crisis, big players going under and the domino effect of other players within the market being basically sucked down into unmanageable uh, debts with them, right? I see. It's um, capitalism run amok, but how would you fix, how would you fix it within the capitalist framework, right? I suppose maybe this is a good time to pivot back a little bit, take a step back to, to think about the, the greater picture here, which is what it actually means uh, to have a fair market, free market, regulated market. Well, how should we think about market design uh, in, in that sense? Because you sent me some very interesting articles uh, by Milton Friedman, by Adam Smith, by Bertrand Harcourt, who, brilliant scholars who write about whether markets and how markets can be regulated. Um, so would love to sort of hear your thoughts on, on these thinkers. Yeah, so, so let's see if we can, um... Uh, uh, talk to the folks out there, the policy punchline uh, fans, and show them how it is that a guy who really does uh, historical research on the origins of capitalism and is, is really a, a man studying ideology is in some sense also informing them about how they can address the regulatory uh, challenges that are in front of them, right? And we categorized, again, we sort of categorized there a bunch of uh, a bunch of ways that we might think about what happened as being violations of market rules, as being uh, uh, actually market actions, or as being market actions that we still might want to ethically criticize. Right? So a lot of my a lot of my work uh, focuses on uh, John Locke. In fact, since I'm a sort of a single-minded uh, type of person, I'd say it's been six or seven years now that I think about nothing but John Locke. Um, love it. And John Locke plays an interesting role in all theories of capitalism. Uh, and, and, I, and I pause there to put the ism on it because the, the question that a lot of the scholars of, uh, of capitalism are asking is when did the capital practices of different banks, um, when did the practices of trading in stocks and et cetera, become an ideology, become an ism? 
uh, become something where people sort of uh, reflexively value the capital side of the equation more than they might value any other side of the uh, equation. Like in our example about uh, you know the depository trust uh, company, you know the margin, the, the liquidity ratios uh, that they set favor capital, and we might want that. We just have to decide, right? So yeah. the question of when it became an ism is when there came to be an ideology that told people that it is ethically appropriate to favor capital. Now, John Locke has been a punching bag in that uh, debate for. Uh, a long, long time. And there are a lot of scholars uh, out there, uh, famous and less famous people, uh, a, a somewhat known guy by the name of Karl Marx uh, and many of his, many of his followers who, who may well have said that at the very least, the time period in which Locke uh, was writing, but in the 1690s was when all his major works came out at least were released at the very least the time period in which he was writing and maybe actually even the guy himself were major ideological justifiers of capitalism that is they brought together all the components that constitute capitalism from bourgeois democracy to liberalism in trade right free trade across national uh, boundaries to property rights, and potentially even to um, a validation of, of sort of speculative financial transactions, that a guy like John Locke actually pulled this magical feat of bringing all the elements of, of capitalism, which were lying at his feet, mere ingredients, right? But he was able to, to, to take the flour and the eggs or whatever and bake a capitalist cake uh, out of it. And they don't always focus on the things that you would consider to be Locke's most famous work. I'm writing primarily about the Second Treatise of Government, which is mentioned in a lot of American high school history textbooks and uh, things like that. But his far more influential works were actually tracts on interest, on the coinage of money, um, a number of works uh, like that. He had works on epistemology, which also, uh, uh, you know, um, bear on money and the morality of uh, money. And then he spent a number of the last years of his life as a public servant, quite literally helping to manage the nascent English empire, um, which at, at the time was uh, expanding its, its colonial holdings. Um, I, can, I can tell you later the way in which it had not yet fully developed into the British empire. There are a hundred ways that you could uh, point to, but it was a nascent imperial colonial uh, power. Okay, so hopefully that's not too much preamble to say. What, it, what I try to do in my work is actually sort of disaggregate all of these things and say that they were not all of a piece, that his theory of property was not the theory of property that most of his critics attribute to him and not a capitalist theory of property. That his theory of uh, liberal democracy, representative government, was perhaps the most influential part of, of his thought and was not intimately tied into a sort of bourgeois stance. That when you look at the merchants and the other bourgeois who he supposedly was defending and allied himself with, he actually in politics aligned himself with their opponents. And you can do things like count votes in parliament and, uh, and et cetera to get a pretty good sense of who he was really aligning himself with. So that work on Locke is really trying to show that a, a lot of, that you can disaggregate these things. If in certain Marxist or other uh, perspectives, um, all bad things go together, all of these elements of, uh, of the thought of a man like his equally corrupt uh, each other, and so therefore all of them need to be uh, dismantled. I'm at least suggesting through this historical work that these things are not all of a piece. Um, much of his thought on markets um, and certainly his thoughts on money and financial uh, transactions are backwards looking. His thought on markets harkens back a lot to late um, scholastic, that is Catholic uh, thought. His thought on money and uh, securities is sometimes just confused. Um, I mean, he was not unlike, I don't wanna make light of this uh, situation, but he's not unlike your 85 year old grandfather trying to get the iPad uh, working. He's seeing see. the Bank of England emerge 
and he's seeing the securitization of, uh, of shares in that bank. And he's <laughs> back and forth and somewhat confused <laughs> about what to do about it at times. I see. I don't think he had a full grasp on what it was to become shortly after his death. How could he? Um, but he, but, but his, but his thought on these things is, is not yet capitalist. And so sort of can't be labeled in that way. I see. Be, be, because he, Locke has been the patron saint of individual rights, more responsibility of the individual actor, which all this stuff seems quite aligned with the modern conservative politics thoughts, line of thought. And, and you um, read his work very differently. So, so I guess, how would you see, what would you suspect that Locke would say about today's situation? Yeah, I was well, sometimes joke in class that I'm fairly sure he would remain resolutely silent having passed away in 1704. Um, but yeah. I get the gist of your uh, I get the gist of your question, and and that's the other I think that's the other side of it. If I am um, in essence trying to sort of uh, rescue Locke and and pull him away from those critics who would want to tear tear him down and and tear certain parts of uh, modern liberal democracy down with him. Um, I'm also trying to pull him back from the Milton Friedmans as well and say, oh, he's not the patron saint of uh, the neoclassical economics uh, that, that you believe he might be or of the neoliberal economics, right? Not all of those e economists identified as neoliberal, Gary Becker did, but others didn't or whatever. Um, but, but economists, economic thinkers like Richard Epstein have said, Locke, if you look at him straightforwardly, is pretty clearly presages uh, our modern sort of neoclassical thought. So I guess it's a little complicated to say whether Epstein is himself the same as Friedman, et cetera, but we'll leave that, leave that to the side. Epstein's a little different, but um, so, uh, so again, this is to say, in essence, I, I, don't, I feel like I've walked into, um, walked into a room where there's a lot of tension and folks are pulling Locke back and forth uh, trying to get him onto their side of the room. This side wants to kill him. This side wants to make him uh, a hero. And I would just like to usher him into a safer corner of uh, the room and say, well, this is really, we can tell from your writings, this is really where you are standing. And you maybe ought not to be a punching bag in these, in these current debates. So uh, I'm not sure that it, that answers the question per se, but, but let's, if you want, let's talk about that you know, paper that I wrote about his about his market thought. And maybe I can clarify for people a little bit what, what it is I'm trying to say here. Sure, would, would love to hear more. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you had any sort of questions about it or, or if, uh, yeah. No, I guess my, my uh, uh, thinking was that because the, the study of economics, I guess, focused entirely on sort of this free market, this kind of idea, but, but as you said, it's kind of more of a recent construction because for most of the human history, mm. um, you know, we, we teetered between variations of community determined pricing and some, you know, had, had a rough beginning of a modern banking system that emerged in the 15th century. Uh, and even as the system um, may seem efficient uh, and based on the needs today, you still suggest mm. that there are moral trade-offs that has, have always been ingrained in the system. And that's what goes back to your, your earlier I guess, arguments that moral thinkings sort of have always been a part of baked in into, into, into capitalism and into the way we think about those things. And that's how sort of Locke comes in to, to address a lot of those moral tensions. Um, th that was kind of my big picture understanding of uh, mm -hmm. what you were trying to say in, so in some way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and so there's, there's this little piece, um, not that not too many would, not too many people would have read called Venditio by Locke, um, which basically translates to on selling. And he takes some very interesting uh, perspectives in there. It's, it's proper and appropriate to say that he takes a free market perspective, but the argument in the paper that you read, it's current research that I'm um, going through the process of publishing now. The argument in the paper that you read is it, it's, it's totally appropriate to call what he was saying there free market thought but also in the sense that it was appropriate to call the late scholastic Spanish uh, thinkers, free market thinkers. And each of the ways in which Locke uh, wanted to 
talk about structuring a market so that there was free, uh, fair and informed transactions was for him justified by an ethical rule. So one that I like to think about, I, I mentioned five uh, different ethical rules, which we all have fairly clear medieval and scholastic roots uh, for him. Some of them are about charity and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but, but one that I think provides a great example uh, is I think sort of offer prices. Offering the same price to any buyer, regardless of their circumstance. Locke seems fairly committed to this, um, uh, to this principle, but in a somewhat weird way, in a, weird, in a way that's made people, uh, made it difficult for people to actually understand what it is uh, that he's saying. He talks about the way in which I could potentially raise the price of a horse that I have for sale at my house when somebody who is in need of the horse comes to buy it from me. And so a lot of people have looked at this and they've said, he explicitly talks in this essay about the way in which the, there is a market price when people have say brought things to market. So a bunch of horses have come to market, they've been compared, people have made bids and offers and so on and so forth. I see what horses are going in the stall nearby. I price my things relative to that or bids or offers get made relative to what they could buy over there and et cetera. So it seems like when he's talking about the market as a physical place, perhaps he has a modern uh, conception uh, of that. The market provides information about the quality of products out there and how to compare them. But then he says, when the transaction is made away from the market, I could ask a higher price. But then he puts this qualification uh, on it. I can go ahead and ask that higher price as long as it's based on essentially on my need for the horse. I would not part with it for less than X. And that might be higher than the market price that he says I would get at the next market, right? I would not part for it except, except for price X. But, and I can do that um, as long as I don't offer it differently to people who might come to my house with different needs. So if somebody comes just needing the horse to, um, just because they want a horse, I would offer them the same price as somebody came, who came to my house who had an urgent need of business, he said. Right? So they needed the horse to transact some. And I can see they're gonna make a hundred pounds uh, from, from simply possessing the horse. But he says, my offer price should actually be 40 pounds to both of them. I see. So there's no Again, can, price discrimination. I can ask discrimination. more than the market. Go ahead. Yeah. In some sense, it's a, like you cannot discriminate between the between the, the buyers. I can ask more than the market. I'm not limited by the market price. Some previous thinkers had said, no, it's unethical, uh, right? To fulfill our ethical duties, we'd have to sell at the market price in the market. Uh, so why would we sell away from the market at anything other than the market price? He clearly isn't saying that. But there nevertheless is an ethical duty to sell to all at the same uh, rate. And the argument of the paper is that this becomes a sort of Rosetta Stone to his thought. This is a need-based uh, economics, not a market transaction or interest-based economics. The price is actually set not by where I am at or whether there are competitors. It's not set by circumstances. I happen to be away from the market you happens to be at the market selling uh, a horse. It is instead based, by, based on human needs. I have X need uh, for the horse and I can't ask more of someone who has X plus 60 need for the horse. And it's a strange requirement, isn't it? It is uh, be because this condition for fairness, as you said, forbade price discrimination that ensures the measure of inequality equality for all and which is kind of what we saw today which is that robin hood allowed everybody to trade equally or, or whatever but uh when things you know uh became not so good they also forbid everybody to came to trade in in, in some way um, yeah so i think we'd see some of the problems in uh in, in that in that particular ideology i think it's important just to recognize that uh that that norm of, uh, of fairness has ethical and sociological roots, right? A historian would chime in uh, right now. And, you know, I wish we had like a live chat or whatever, because there could be historians who would chime in and they would say, well, actually the, the 
you know, the, the social practice of offering the same price uh, to all was really solidified by the Wanamaker uh, department stores in Philadelphia when they became the first department store to sort of advertise themselves in America as offering the same price uh, to all. But the really interesting uh, thing, I think, is that you can trace all the way back to medieval markets for fish coming off of the Thames River. And you can see that uh, regulations placed on medieval markets had the same sort of fairness justifications all the way back then. It wasn't invented by John Locke. It wasn't invented by Wanamaker department stores. Within the Anglo-American tradition, it, was, it traced its way all the way back uh, to these various sort of important ethical roots of, of fairness. Are there other systems that do it in another way? Of course. And can you reach prices that are fair in another way? Absolutely. It feels really strange uh, to someone like me. I like to travel. Can't stand bargaining over the price of things. Would much prefer a set price to be marked uh, on the item. Um, but my discomfort doesn't mean there's, there's another ethical way to reach a fair price. It's just that this ethical way of fair pricing has a unique history and ethical uh, justification within a particular tradition. I see because you were talking about the medieval foundation for this idea of communal market norms. We were talking about some of those norms, such as uh, you have to advertise the uh, the, the goods publicly, you have to leave some time for people to bid. Uh, mm -hmm. There has to be some kind of condition of fairness that cannot uh, allow for price discrimination. Those are some of the norms that were, that were being said. And right. uh, the, the scholastics were very much against this kind of laissez-faire policies and thought the market needed rules and regulations. So that was something very much uh, embedded back then in the markets, the, the thought that morality and, and fairness needed to be there. Yeah, uh, th that's right. Um, but another way to say that is that until laissez-faire came to mean what it meant in the 20th century, laissez-faire, free markets, had no place. actually meant these ethical rules. I see. That these are rules of freedom that they allow um, for the buyer uh, to freely transact, uh, to be certain that the informational environment was constructed in such a way that they can trust in the price uh, that was given, etc., to be sure that the supply was constructed uh, in such a way that there is genuine competition between the actual providers. And so there were rules against, as you saw in that paper, rules against forestalling the market at the time, gathering up the uh, goods, um, whether it be fish or wheat or whatever it might be, gathering up these goods 10 miles outside of uh, London and essentially putting a squeeze, a different type of squeeze, a wheat squeeze, a fish squeeze, put it, putting a squeeze on uh, the markets in London in order to drive the price up. Uh, that would be considered forestalling. There were also regulations against essentially um, sort of uh, withdrawing your goods from market if that would have the effect of driving the price up. So the price for the day was set based on supplies coming in to the city and you could accept more than or less than within a certain range, more than or less than that price as was considered fair uh, at the time, your goods might be better or your goods might be worse. But if you waited for a calamity to occur late in the day or waited for supply to dry up late in the day, you still had to be within the range of the, of the asking uh, price so that uh, time wouldn't end up unfairly affecting, um, I don't know, uh, think of it as uh, working mothers who had to buy at 5 p.m. rather than grandmothers who could buy at 9 a.m. Right. right. So that a certain time discrimination was eliminated by these rules. Previous scholars have looked back at this and they've said, oh, those Catholics, right? I'm Catholic, yeah. one of the reasons I'm interested in this yeah. <laughs> uh, tradition. Previous scholars have looked back at this and they said, oh, those Catholics, the Picayune regulations that they put in order to interfere with market transactions. And I'm trying to look at it and I'm trying to say, those Picayune regulations that they placed were about establishing free and fair markets. That is precisely what Locke picked up from them and so what we see in Locke really is a notion of regulating the market 
such that you achieve free and fair transactions. I see. So circling back around to what we were talking about with yeah. Robin Hood, at the origins of liberal democracy, at the origins of the modern banking system, at the origins of uh, modern thinking about uh, property rights, uh, first cuts being made in the aristocratic land system in around about Locke's time, at the origin of all these things is actually what we see, what we see is an ideology of free and fair markets established by appropriate, non-invasive, um, not paternalistic for sure, but appropriate regulations, regulations with an ethical foundation. I see. Uh, Professor Kautz, I guess this might be a good time for us to talk about what kinds of regulations would lead to that, uh, I guess, vision of free and fair markets because uh, as, as we briefly alluded to, someone like Milton Friedman had a very, obviously would have very different viewpoints compared to many other thinkers. And um, I think Milton Friedman was saying, that, I mean, ultimately he, he, what he thinks has moral worth is a, a person's uh, free will to choose, uh, to, to freely live his or her life. Uh, and that it's imperative that the state does not intervene, interfere with the person's life. Uh, so the government was obviously considered in Milton Friedman's eyes to do something that the market can, cannot do it itself. So, so that's the only kind mm -hmm. of moment that the government should step in. Uh, right. And so I would love to, I guess, hear a little bit more of your thoughts on, on Milton Friedman and how Locke's line of thinking uh, influenced other thinkers and, and kind of uh, where we got from, uh, from the medieval time uh, to the beginning of capitalism to, to today. Right. So I think one way to say this is that I see uh, Locke as giving a conception of the ways in which the sort of input regulations, the constitutive regulations uh, of the market are themselves ethical. So setting up uh, setting up free trade, setting up, uh, like I said, sort of the environment of the market in such a way that information freely flows about available goods and their prices and et cetera, that he sees setting up those constitutive rules as itself an ethical task. And that he wouldn't differ from somebody like Friedman on the abstract level of saying, well, there also need to be regulatory rules with respect uh, to a market, because even once you set up the game of baseball, there are gonna be H the Houston Astros. Even once you set up the game of baseball 90 feet to a base, even once there are constitutive rules of baseball, there are people who are going to try to cheat within them. And so, of course, you need to come in at that, uh, at that point and perhaps reduce their power to cheat, punish, sanction, um, put a salary cap on so that they don't have a monopoly, something Milton Friedman was very uh, worried about and, and gave a role that he gave to government, put a salary cap on those damn Yankees uh, so that they don't have monopolized uh, player contracts and et cetera, and, and essentially win in that way. So you may need these regulatory rules that, that reduce ethical violations, but the constitutive rules, the thing that set up the game that we call a market are not just somehow like es establishing writing down what had always been man's natural practice, uh, right? From the time that man and woman walked out of the garden of Eden and they carried out markets in this way or something like that. These are constitutive uh, rules. I wanna put a plug in actually for somebody I don't know if anybody wants to um, study Locke's Venditio because the, the alternative perspective, this perspective I'm disagreeing with is from a very brilliant uh, economist named Michael Munger uh, at Duke. And he has a reading of the Venditio, which is absolutely 100% plausible, but it takes that perspective. It essentially says, well, the const of course, Locke assumed that there were constitutive rules about what it would mean to have a free market. So let's just sort of wave our hands at those and not look at those ethically. And when you do that sort of hand waving, you can see that he was really a free market uh, thinker. He wasn't trying to put ethical brakes on the market ever. Once you have these rules established, you just let it run. Well, my argument against Michael Munger is, no, it's, it's the constitutive rules that are themselves the ethics uh, of the market. And you can see that when you look at where these rules came from, their medieval and often Catholic origins. I see, I see. Uh, so so we, we talked about John Locke, Venditio, and, and 
that line of thinking we we talked about we kind of talked about Milton Friedman and some of that ideas but then it comes to the idea of how to actually regulate market which which a lot of people would say the idea of self-regulation actually means two things uh, one line of thinking is uh, unregulated the other is self-regulated and there's a crucial difference there so would you mind telling us a little bit more of, of your thoughts on that that front yeah so I think that some of the some of the glue you can use to move from this historical thought into uh, into contemporary analysis like that is performed. I'm going to recommend another uh, reading now. Uh, uh, another brilliant uh, scholar at Columbia Law, I, I believe, still Bernard Harcourt, who I who I do know in in, in um, passing, but uh, he wrote an excellent book called The Illusion of Free Markets. Um, and I assign it all the time uh, to my students to get at this uh, distinction. He looks at the Chicago Board of, uh, of Trade and says, well, if we look at what a self-regulated market would look like, right? so a Board of Trade might have a, uh, so we're just going to use general terms for it here, a sort of Board of Governors uh, within it. And it's often the case that the people best situated to, to police and to update the rules about fair trade in a market are traders themselves. I mean, who knows what's really going on? You and I could ramble on for a while about what we think goes on in, in wheat futures markets at the Chicago Board of Trade, but man, uh, I don't think we know. Who really knows? The traders. And so when you get boards of governors or regulatory uh, boards within these self-regulating markets, what you get is folks who are who are at the time traders. And there are rules that uh, try to um, sort of disaggregate their roles in, in certain ways to try to ensure that in their activity as regulator, they're not corrupted by the interest they might have in an ongoing trading position. They might have a seat on the very same uh, exchange. There are rules that try to keep these things separate. Um, there are various rules about the times in which trades can occur. There are various rules about the pricing at which uh, trading can occur. Um, uh, so that for instance, if in order to close out the books at the end of the day, a particular, um, you know, someone who has a seat on the, on, on the exchange needs a little bit of extra time. I don't wanna oversimplify it here, but it's a little bit like an extension on a paper. If they need a little bit of extra time in order to close out their trades, they can do that, but it has to be within a certain margin of the closing price of that day so that folks can know that they're not somehow engaging in a manipulative trade. So there's a time regulation. There are price controls of certain sorts. There are separations between the role of regulator and the role of a uh, trader. There are um, rules about uh, differential pricing, same price being offered to anyone. So anyone who's gotten this far in the podcast is gonna be like, okay, now you're making it too obvious, man. The rules are the same. In a self-regulated market like the Chicago Board of Trade, the rules, the conceptions of fairness and the rules that get set up around them are the same. And we have the SEC and regulatory bodies within the United States policing the Chicago Board of Trade as well, so that as they self-regulate from the inside, set rules for their own uh, markets and et cetera, they don't stray with outside, the, outside of the boundaries, but the constitutive rules are the same. So in that sense, what Harcourt is observing is that the Chicago Board of Trade is a self-regulating market and the federal government, um, well, keep repeating that they were punishing people so that it would remain a self-regulating market. But if that were true, that would, it means is that any sort of fair market in order to regulate itself pro properly can't just make whatever rules it wants. So it's no longer, in that sense, it's no longer a self-regulating market. Yeah, um, I, wanna, I wanna draw the ethical conclusion from, uh, from that, that maintenance, proper, proper ethical consideration and maintenance of those constitutive rules uh, of the market, constantly having that conversation and making sure that they fit uh, our ethical uh, needs and our needs as a society, however defined, that that is an ethical imperative. Har Harcourt's book 
I'm not 100% sure I want to put words in his mouth and say that he goes there because he wants to tell something like a Foucauldian genealogy of this simply. And he wants to say that we have come to imagine ourselves as operating in uh, these free markets, um, free from all interference and you know almost a nihilistic freedom. But in reality, we're just doing what wheat traders would have done in, in Paris in the 1780s uh, or what my wheat traders from my lock paper would have done in London and uh, Dunkirk and Ostend, uh, the examples Locke uses, uh, in, uh, in the 1690s. So he's simply trying to tell a genealogical story. Oh, we've come to view ourselves as being some sense freed from, I don't know, floating in a nihilistically free universe of individual transactions, but we're just doing what people did in the past. And then I want to draw, draw an ethical conclusion from that. It is imperative that we tend this garden, that we tend these constitutive rules in an ethically appropriate way. We're going to end up with horribly skewed market outcomes that nobody is going to like. I see. And this is also what Carl Polandi is saying, another great political theorist. Who, what he said in The Great Transformation, The Political and Economic Origins of Our Time. And he I mean, his book is just a, a phenomenal and such an important transformative book in, in political theory. And, and he, would, he gave multiple examples, whether the gold standard or whether uh, it's uh, sort of England at, at the beginning of capitalism, that when you have this idea of self-regulating markets, it, it ended up not really becoming a self-regulating market. And it becomes, as you said, very skewed in terms of the rules and the direction it goes. Yeah. If not properly tended, yeah, that's that's certainly one of his most important uh, contributions. Is um, uh, is realizing that? Uh, sorry, a brief uh, um, uh, loss of my train of thought there. You know how it is during a pandemic; things happen in your home. Yeah, uh, yeah. And all of a sudden, you're like, "I'm supposed to be in class right now," but all of a sudden, X just just sort of. <laughs> intruded my mind space. Yeah. <laughs> I'll apologize to you uh, in that case. No, all good. I was thinking, does my wife need me right now? No, no, no. <laughs> Everything's good in the house too. So we can go. But yeah, I mean, a super important, and one of the reasons why I have uh, students read uh, Polanyi is that argument that he makes. It's that, um, you know, through these changes in political economy through the uh, 19th century, and especially heading into what he refers to as the Great War, World War uh, One. He's writing on the exit end of uh, World War Two, but he's still referring to World War One as the Great War. He says, heading into that war, people had become so convinced by their own press releases that the free and literally unregulated market would work uh, magic that they crashed their own system in upon themselves. And he points back at he points fingers at a lot of the um, past thinkers who helped contribute to this. Now, one of the things I don't like po about Polanyi is that he points fingers at my guy Locke and I'm kind of over here trying to like, you know, protect Locke and say, I you see. don't need to be part of these battles, but maybe that's just a personal thing. I, I prefer to defend Locke, but the trans same transformation that I'm pointing to and the ways in which ideas change slowly over time, he's pointing to and, and the, the awful consequences that can come about. He literally thinks World War I came about because of a, of a collective self-delusion, you might call it, that literally unregulated markets um, I see. work for international trade. Uh, perhaps we can quickly tie back to what is happening today because uh, I was reading uh, one of your lectures and you were saying how uh, what Harcourt was saying, what uh, Milton Freeman was saying, which we just talked about Carl Polanyi, is one thing that Harcourt points out is to the imaginaries that we have, what uh, government regulated markets looked like in the past and what self-regulating markets look like today. Is that there seems to be a cognitive dissonance there because we essentially tell ourselves stories uh, how government regulation in the past was overwhelming was controlling, it was inefficient, and how today's self-regulating markets uh, are adaptable, more efficient. Uh, and we see that narratives over and over again, So, which is that I, I think people realize we cannot have unregulated markets. Mm -hmm. And people always, but still make, you know, the, there's still that two, uh, two ideo ideological 
uh, views that, that are competing with each other. One is more libertarian, the other is more kind of, well, you can call it paternalistic or simply they care a little bit more about social welfare, they care about uh, not letting things run amok. So, but, but everybody seems to agree that we need to regulate the markets in some way, but we also have somewhat of a cognitive dissonance about what markets used to look like and what markets are looking like today, which is basically what we've been talking about in the past hour, hour with all kinds of historical examples. Yeah. And certainly, yeah, to come back at, so one of the reasons why I thought this GameStop example was you know, a perfect opportunity for us uh, to talk is the cognitive dissonance sometimes on display. I mean, hey, this isn't, this isn't a critique of uh, people. I think cognitive dissonance might be my middle name, but uh, you know, it's a thing we fall into, isn't it? All of us, but the cognitive dissonance on display in some of these critiques, right? So if we think of it, self-regulated markets, in this way that we've been talking about with historical examples, that choices are gonna to have to get made about the constitutive rules of the game. Those choices are gonna end up having distributive effects in certain ways, absolutely. But we may need to let the players within the game have a certain amount of leeway to self-regulate, right? Catching them when they literally commit fouls and et cetera, but a certain amount of leeway to self-regulate in order to sort of make their, make their markets work. Uh, et cetera, we end up with the situation that we're at with depository trust and clearing corporation and the outrage that people felt about them raising their liquidity uh, requirements was to me uh, a, a, moral, a moralistic outrage, which I want them to feel, right? Because unless we're ethically assessing everything that's going on uh, around us, I think we could, you know, as Polanyi suggests, we could go well off the, the rails, but the actual uh, ethical phenomenon to assess was the self-regulating market itself. It, it is the case that we let, for some good reasons, the market players within those markets um, set certain rules with respect to liquidity requirements and how to use the clearinghouses and et cetera, et cetera. Those are gonna have distributive uh, requirements and we can adjust the constitutive rules so that unfairness doesn't happen again, but, but you weren't somehow defrauded simply because depository trust clearinghouse did this. That's a, a different ethical. If we had our whiteboard up here, I would say if we could put certain ethical critiques over here. Those things might have happened and we might want to say those things. But with respect to self-regulating markets, we have to think somewhat differently. I see. So with just going off what you, your, your concluding sentence there, with respect to <laughs> self-regulating markets, we have to think differently. What are some of the things that you would recommend us to think about in, t in today's context? Because uh, is, are the markets always under some kind of manipulation in one way or the other? And what is the right framework we should be thinking about today's situation? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when I, when I teach uh, these things, my, my uh, students take away whatever lessons they want. I, I um, you know, I adore analyzing texts by Milton Friedman as, as much as I adore putting an opponent, Bernard Harcourt, in, in conversation uh, with Milton Friedman. Um, but speaking for, for myself as, a, as an ethical citizen, sometimes ethical citizen, um, speaking for myself, I would say, right, that's some of the, some of the things that we need to, to, to think about, uh, like, like, like you're, uh, like you're suggesting are to think in a bit finer grain detail than we do in, in our, uh, in our discourse about the various isms that seem to be in clash, uh, with each other. Um, the SEC further clamping down on, on um, capitalization uh, requirements, um, right, for depository trust uh, or whatever, um, you know, putting harder margin requirements and, and so on and so forth is not creeping socialism. Uh, let's start there, folks. Um, let's not label every attempt to regulate markets as anti capitalist that capitalism itself, the ism part of it, is an ethical theory of valuing regulated markets because there is no such thing 
as a market not regulated, if there is, it's likely to crash real soon. We can get into some examples about that, but the ism in capitalism is about, uh, is what ethical theory will we use to talk about what regulations we shall have uh, in markets? Let's embrace and love talk about market regulations and then argue over which ones we should have. Of course, we're gonna differ. The distributive effects will affect our social classes, uh, our races, our genders, our uh, regions of the country and et cetera, differently in all these ways. It doesn't short circuit any of those uh, debates, but those debates ought to be freely and openly allowed in a capitalist society. I see, so that's the st st starting point we should have in, in some sense. Let's have the debate about regulation to, to be a capitalist. I mean, I guess to say it, and I don't want anybody to print this on a t-shirt or anything, but uh, to be a de to be a capitalist is to have a debate about appropriate market regulations. I see. Um, and not to shun from. everything that smells of a market regulation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, which is the danger of whether the discourse could evolve to. Uh, mm. but, but, but I guess the, the, the other danger would be that anything that shies away from saying that the system overall is corrupt, or whatever, is immediately corrupt, which is that if you don't think the Wall Street establishment is corrupt, you are probably in bed with them or, 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 or you're just not seeing this dude. What is going on with you? Um, and yeah. and uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've received like in my own uh, work over time, I've received this sort of ping ponging uh, reception of my work. Uh, it's a bit of a prism of, as to who the audience uh, is. Um, uh, because not that anybody's <laughs> staying awake at night thinking, how does Celts think about markets, right? But um, when I engage uh, with people, it's it's you know entirely possible that they come away uh, thinking that I'm a a, a pink tied uh, banker uh, apologist uh, for capitalism, or it's entirely possible that they come away uh, thinking that I'm a uh, a communist a socialist disguising his uh, thoughts by referencing Catholic thinkers and John Locke, right? As if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling a switcheroonie on them. Um, and, and, I, and it's not, I'm just in a different corner of, uh, of that debate saying, look over here, capitalism can be an ideology of free and fair markets. In some sense, it must be. I see. Um... I guess the, the next step of our question, could, which is an interesting direction to go to, maybe contract clauses, which is, mm. so we, we talked about uh, kind of the, the more uh, moral history uh, of, of markets, uh, the, the self-regulating ideas and, yeah. and so on. Um, we've also talked about um, Milton Friedman, we talked about um, hardcore, yeah. we talk about these thinkers. Uh, and there's the idea of contract clauses that you talked about with me, which I think is fascinating. It would be great for our listeners to know about. Right. So as much as I think sort of a lot of this ethical learning can actually be uh, achieved by deep study of uh, John Locke, my um, Princeton students have suggested kindly to me that 12 weeks on John Locke might be too much. So, um, I'd say that uh, ironically, but um, so taking these topics and actually moving through, seeing the way the, in which these debates uh, played out in different uh, aspects of history and in different public policy and political debates that people have had over the, over the course of uh, time is a way to put, a, put together a pretty good unit on, uh, on market thought. I teach other things as well, but so for instance, in a, a course called Ethics and Public Policy that uh, I did a few years ago for the Woodrow Wilson School, excuse me, School of Public and International Affairs, uh, for the, uh, in that course, um, I looked at issues like self-regulation in the Chicago Board of Trade. I looked at thinkers like Locke. I looked at debates over the meaning of the United States Constitution and how it is that the change in the meaning of the contract clause over the course of time has signaled a change in the meaning of what a corporation is. 
And of course, there's a lot of debate. Um, Princeton, perhaps mercifully for its students, doesn't have a business school. Um, some of you will end up going on to business school, but many Princeton students ha have heard already about uh, shareholder value theory versus stakeholder value theory. Right? What is what is the what is the purpose of the modern corporation? What is the CEO charged with as her purpose in carrying out leadership of the modern corporation uh, today? These questions about the interpretation of the Constitution sort of essentially arrive there. What what is what is it to be a corporation? How has that idea changed over the course of time? And can we see how this sort of ideology of uh, of markets has altered and sometimes maybe moved in dangerous directions uh, as that theory of the corporation has changed? I see uh, because the the when it comes to shareholder value maximization, this is the interesting role that Milton Friedman played in history, advocating for, for the theory. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting that you sent me that his famous op-ed about that celebrated its 50th anniversary not very, very long ago. So yeah, uh, yeah. 50 months ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and that, that, that is an ongoing debate that is going on right now. And I think more people, more and more people are talking about stakeholder theory and abandoning the, the, the ideals of shareholder theory, the shareholder maximization mantra for the corporations, basically. Okay. So Milton Friedman plays a, yeah, a pivotal uh, role and not only in his uh, technical economic uh, work, but in that op-ed written for the New York Times or the Times Magazine um, uh, called the social responsibility of businesses to maximize its profits. Uh, I think I got the, got the title right there. Um, uh, yeah, published in um, September 71. Um, and yeah, there, you know, there had been legal rulings and other folks talking about shareholder value maximization. And so if anybody wants to do some Googling, it's actually a real fun uh, story about uh, a court case called Dodge versus Ford that you can look up. Um, uh, while the original uh, Mr. Ford, the founder of, uh, of the company, um, was still running the company. Uh, there were uh, two major shareholders. I think they had, but they both had seats on uh, the board uh, by the last name Dodge. And um, they saw that, uh, uh, Mr. Ford saw that the Dodge brothers were actually pushing him to maximize the value of their shares because they wanted to take the money out and start a competing company, which came I to see. be known as Dodge. I see. Right? And so Mr. Ford, was like, to, to hell with you. Um, I know exactly what uh, to do. I'll just invest further in things that I have already been committed to, which such as wages and opening new factories and I won't give dividends, so on and so forth. And so yeah. it's a super weird thing uh, that he did. He, when he refused to maximize his shareholder value, it was fairly clearly to starve out competition within his market. So the judge that ruled in that case said, no, 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 CEOs have a responsibility to serve shareholder value. But that judge was saying that in a context of a pretty clear sort of double market violation. Maybe the CEO wasn't doing enough for the shareholders, maybe, but also Mr. Ford was doing that very specifically to starve a competitor uh, of resources. Right. right. So the theory didn't fully catch on at that time, uh, but did in the wake of Milton Friedman's argument that the social response, that the CEO essentially has no uh, social responsibility other than to maximize the value of shares the shareholders. for the shareholders. They are the owners of the company. I see. And that's kind of, one could say, the, the reason that gave rise to American capitalism. That's the history of American capitalism, which is that without the period of laissez-faire, uh, <laughs> tax cutting, deregulating uh, market booms, whether it's back in the 80s from Reagan era or even earlier when you know, we were talking about Ford versus Dodge, but you know, much earlier than that, uh, the history of American capitalism is one that is about creative destructions, one that about mm -hmm. some kind of laissez-faire structure that is very much still ingrained in today's 
view of how people look at Silicon Valley, how people look at regulation, antitrust. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we seem to be in a historical moment, in my view, that, you know, uh, we, we've been in that kind of laissez-faire situation for a while. And now there's uh, the, the, the appeal, the proposal to move much dramatically towards the, the other direction, which is uh, higher taxation for the rich, stronger mm -hmm. regulation, antitrust regulations against uh, the tech companies and, and so on, w which is kind of going the other direction. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that the, one of the ways that, that uh, I wanna challenge that is by saying, I'll, I'll put it in, in, in terms of like, you know, teaching, teaching students this stuff, what, what, what effect uh, can it have in changing their ethical mindset towards things like corporate structure? Um, well, it's, it, um, people tend to come away. I do actually even remember a very specific student uh, I had one time who said, no, the purpose of a corporation is to maximize uh, shareholder value. I learned it in AP Econ. Um, and so uh, thus, it, thus it has been, thus it is, and thus it shall always be. Speak some Latin, it's the truth. Um, and I just simply want to shake, that may, be the, that may be the best way to organize corporations. Absolutely, we should ha have a debate uh, about that. Uh, we know that certain corporations don't choose to organize themselves in that way. Co Columbia Sportswear, uh, you know, for instance, right? long-standing, wildly successful company offering highly expensive products that have actually kind of never come down to market pricing for equivalent products, et cetera. They do a lot of things that defy uh, what we think of as Econ 101, um, but a longstanding business. But to the extent that people think um, there just is one way and only one way to think about corporations, thus it is, thus it has always been, I just want to show them it hasn't always been that way. It might be ebb and flux and flow in how people think of the relationship of the CEO to uh, the shareholders. It might be some people willing to talk about that relationship without using the word maximize, which is mathematically maybe problematic. Um, but the debate is to me, I, I would come, I, my rejoinder to what you said earlier is that the history of American capitalism is the history of an ongoing debate about these things all of the sides deserving, many of the sides deserving the name American capitalism. I see. Um, so, so along that train of thought, uh, th does contract clause play, play any role in this? Because I know you sent me this video that where you explained contract clauses and how that kind of played a, a, a role in somewhat shaping our conception of capitalism. And obviously in today's context, uh, you know, the, the relationship between the trading platforms and the users in Robinhood is up for right. dispute, you know, after, you know, you halt the trading of those certain stocks, but that should yeah. have some kind of contract feeling there, you know, the, this kind of guarantee for the future credibility, this kind of forward looking sense. So what are your thoughts on, on that front and how that may have changed our some of our political theoretical implications for, for capitalism? So in the um, in some of in some of what I uh, go over with my students, and I've also written about uh, James Madison and the early history of uh, the Constitution and his relationship um, uh, to what he called the great capitalists of the manufacture, um, a somewhat strained relationship with this thing that he actually did use the label capitalism for, or at least the capitalists he referred to at one point in his writings. So the history of this within the American constitutional structure is something I'm interested in and have, have taught about. You could say that the contract clause, here's one perspective on it, that the contract clause in the US uh, constitution um, is um, basically forbidding the state governments to interfere with contracts that have already been sort of sealed, uh, as it were, have already been agreed to. One way to look at it is the contract clause has been a bit of an empty shell for the ideological thought of different courts over the course of time. And I want to clarify the use of the word ideological. I'm not saying it's inappropriate to engage in a sort of moral reading of the Constitution, 
but that they came in with understandings of what corporations are and what contracts between um, sort of free agents within an economic system look like. And that over the course of time from Justice John Marshall, who um, wrote some of the first contract clause cases, uh, Dartmouth versus Woodward, to um, Roger Taney, who wrote the Charles River Bridge uh, case. If anybody out there uh, has, has not heard of the Charles River Bridge case, just read about it. Uh, it's amazing. Um, you know, to Lochner versus New York much later, uh, and then throughout the course of the 20th century uh, as well, and now into the 21st, the contracts clause has contract clause has been used as a as an empty vessel in some ways to sort of enact a theory of what it is that economic transaction means, um, and it does seem that we're back in, um, and we're, that we're back in a. a a time uh, within American history where the uh, where the corporation is being given uh, assigned many more of the legal attributes of individual personhood and being seen much more as a free and not overly powerful uh, player within contract markets. Right? And you can see that in cases that are uh, you know based on the potential religious rights that certain closely held corporations uh, might have, Hobby Lobby, Little Sisters of the Poor, two recent cases. You can see it in Citizens United and et cetera. Um, this is not by any means the first time that a US Supreme Court has declared that corporations are people, because in some sense, Mitt Romney was right about that, corporations are people. The debate over the course of time has been about which of the attributes of individual personhood rights and roles in markets do we attribute to corporations as we see them as players within a, con within a contractual framework. And it seems to be that we're in a period now where um, more of those rights of an individual are being attributed uh, to the corporation. I think sometimes to the detriment of, uh, of, of workers. I guess the interesting thing about the contracts, which is uh, you posed a series of questions uh, in your video lecture that you sent me, which why is this so important that statements be forbidden from it? What, what is a contract? Uh, federal government was given the power of, you know, bankruptcy and, and given other power as well to alter contracts. And that was obviously a very significant part of that. And, and one argument was that the founders intended for capitalists, right, the government yeah. to only inter intervene on private transactions, the, uh, the contract clauses should forbid a lot of the regulations um, and the, there were even implications from back in the Green New, uh, not the Green New Deal, the Neo Deal yeah, uh, yeah, of course. phase. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, right. And so, so, and so uh, uh, folks who, who lo know a lot about, about their American history know that that, um, uh, that resurgence of that, it might have been the surgence of that perspective. But I'd like to think, I think of it as a resurgence of that perspective that even the Lochner era was a resurgence of an idea that had been there in certain thinkers uh, in the past. And the resurgence of that idea in the early 1900s up to the doorstep of, uh, of, the, uh, of the New Deal um, was a significant era of gaining, uh, of gaining power for corporations. And I, I think not inappropriately, we should, we should see the debate over it as being the debate about how we wish to steer a capitalist structure rather than, hey, the court was capitalist from 1905 until 1930 uh, X or whatever. And then all of a sudden they turned socialist under the, uh, the influence of a, you know, under the corruption of a former governor from New York or whatever FTR was, I think a former governor from New York. I see. I see. That, that that's interesting. <laughs> the, the 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 FDR presidency that that uh, how that impacted things. But um, I guess this it might be a good time to start tying things back because we uh, really talked about so much. I guess just just to summarize a little bit for our for our listeners, what we've been saying this whole interview is that GameStop opens up the possibility for all kinds of questions. One is the moral basis of market exchange rules, as with Locke. Uh, then we talked about the question of market regulation, 
uh, as in the case of Harcourt, of Milton Friedman, right? What are the situ? How, how do you actually regulate market? What is it, does it mean to be a self-regulating market? Do those illusions work? And then the third, as we, we just talked about, which is corporate structure, uh, contract clauses, um, you know, uh, shareholder value maximization versus stakeholder and so on. Um, so tying all the way back to the beginning of our discussion, which is what the hell is actually going on today? Was it a proletarian revolution? Uh, is, it, is the market still functioning? Uh, I, I think it's quite important for us to, to go back to this question, which is uh, uh, it, it seems that people still have faith that the market is working in some way and versus some people saying the market just isn't working at all anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's this question of whether any market structure would be inherently in some way manipulated by some kind of centralized node, some kind of player that yeah. had uh, already set some moral value embedding into the system. So uh, yeah. perhaps Professor Kautz, w- would you like to, to, I guess, gradually tie everything back together into today's situation, given all the, all the conversation we've had about these thinkers? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that um, there may be a, a perspective from, uh, from studying history. And, and, and I don't want to say that I'm a historian. I do history of political thought. Um, and, you know, that, that, um, that distinction matters for uh, some people. Um, so I just want to lay that out there. But say the, the perspective that you get from, uh, from studying history is sometimes that, you know, everything uh, new had already been old, everything old is new again. And that I'm not terribly worried by the more alarmist um, um, cries that have gone up about how this is the final downfall of the markets. It could be psychologically that certain people who are on these apps will no longer trade uh, trust the, the um, the establishment again and so forth. I don't wanna make social psychological uh, predictions, but if the sort of ideological statements that they're making are that the market is now fully corrupt and we thought it was corrupt before and it has now fully fallen apart, right? I would say, you know, it's per- perhaps not all that bad. We reach for historical models that are familiar uh, to us in order to explain the events that we see, right? So you've engaged in your Substack with people who would use proletarian revolution as the model. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. But notice that, but that's a that's a, a groping effort. I know you disagree with that um, model to a certain degree, but that's a, a groping effort to place this within a historical model that we've actually seen. Absolutely, yes. Right? Bolsheviks uh, or, or something like that, except in this case, they're Bolsheviks with video game consoles, uh, Reddit and, pages, and, and, yes. and Reddit pages, and and enough and enough disposable income. You know, they yeah. they saved enough from 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 not eating avocado toast. That they yes, were able to invest in Game Stop. So these are weird proletarians, <laughs> by all means, right? <laughs> but we're groping for the analogy that the historical analogy that would tell us what just happened in front of us. And I don't know, I, I would I'm sort of just urge people, it's all sort of copacetic, don't worry about it, uh, right? This is actually a, a market perturbance and a set of uh, debates, which I can show you have occurred for 500 years on more or less the same grounds. We do debate the constitutive roles of the market. Should the, you, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, I can't remember the name, so I wrote it down for myself. Okay. DTCC, yeah. <laughs> yeah. DTCC. Um, should they have that power within the market and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, we should absolutely be having that uh, debate, but the sky isn't falling because we're having that debate about constitutive rules. The regulatory rules about self-dealing and so on that might have gone on, even about the sort of wink and a nod self-deal that Robin Hood may well have uh, pulled. We should absolutely have those debates. They don't cause me to question uh, whether the capitalist structure is flexible enough to adapt to many of our needs, not all of us, but many of our needs. Um, I see. So in, in essence, I, I, don't want, I don't want to be the little dog in, uh, in, the, in the room who's, you know, the room that's on fire, you know, the meme, the little dog yes, in the room that's yes. on fire being like, everything's fine here. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I am saying here, everything's fine here. Just, I, we need I to see. have these debates, but markets are functioning. And, and it would be violated. weird if, we, if we're not having those conversations. So, so it's not really weird that we are having those debates. And, and we see the parallels, historical parallels all the time about regulating markets, regulated markets versus self-regulating markets versus unregulated markets um, yeah. even today. Uh, I guess the next interesting or slightly weird question would be Bitcoin. I, yeah. My current virtual Zoom background, it has the painting of a Bitcoin. And yeah. uh, th that's the background I chose for today's interview. And I was thinking about Bitcoin because so many people that are part of this, re 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 you know, let's just call it a quote unquote revolution, financial revolution, uh, believe, well, in some way, some people genuinely believe that the monetary system or the financial system will come to a crash one day. So they're really true believers of a vision like Bitcoin. Some others may simply think that, oh, as long as enough people believe in that, and as long as people have uh, those debates uh, about capitalism, about market structure, then there will be enough volatility and enough doubts on the system. And the doubt on the system alone would already uh, drive up the, the, the cr pr uh, prices like crazy. So Bitcoin is at around $33,000 per coin these days, which is unthinkable if you think about it a year ago or two years ago. So th th these, these kind of uh, all signs, all signs are, are, are showing that society seems to be deviating from this quote unquote funda fundamentalist framework or the rationalist view of how things should be, right? Uh, in a rational world, GameStop should never have its stock price shot up to 300 bucks. In, in a rational world, why would uh, Bitcoin, something that has just come out of nowhere, uh, be valued as such a huge valuation? So it's, it's or, or Tesla or, yeah. or anybody. And yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 do you have any thoughts on, on, on the future of, of these? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I got super interested uh, in Bitcoin and, and, and various different other blockchain based uh, coin models, um, because I started to hear that, that, that type of dialogue emerging, what you were just saying, um, right there, which is, you know, that part of that, part of that is always people say, folks are fed up with the system sort of as it exists. And so they want to walk into these spaces that are both markets and currencies at the same time. Um, and they want to walk into these markets that, that, that are unregulated. Right? That word is often uh, used, that there isn't a government overseeing these things. And I've always tried to urge, not, not that I'm a pessimist or a historical determinist of, of any sort, but I'm certainly quite skeptical that as people step into those markets, it's somehow going to end up being a different question of market regulation. And so, so, so one of the things that, I've, that you and I have talked about is you know, some of the research that I've done on, um, uh, on blockchain governance that a lot of the blockchain uh, companies and the blockchains that are out there, the folks who are on them using them have encountered governance problems, lo and behold, exactly like the problems of non-regulation, self-regulation, uh, right? Or government regulation that we sort of compared in, in our historical journey together. That, that there, there isn't a way, I think, to escape um, the very problems that, that exist uh, within uh, markets. And part of that, I think, as, uh, as you say, is that they have to be flexible enough and cushioned enough to um, weather the blows of these sort of animal spirits, uh, as it were, as people start to behave irrationally or, or, or weirdly uh, with respect to their, uh, to their purchases, with respect to their currency, with respect to securities, with respect to the contracts they make with each other, another important element of any blockchain. Um, the system has to be flexible enough to absorb what's going to uh, uh, occur. Because you asked this very interesting question, which is Bitcoin is, you know, is where fast changing conditions led to this private market that was too fast for anybody to step in to you know, regulate or protect or whatever. 
uh, by construction, the technology is decentralized. By construction, the rise of the technology uh, was in, inherently counter to any government control. The, the, the greater you try to tame it, the, the more danger the people perceive and the higher the prices and the more popular the Bitcoin becomes. And uh, in, in some sense, um, what should our, be our conclusion from that? Maybe in the sense that private market is a good thing, maybe in the sense that there will continue to be those disruptive technologies. And, and, and even, though, even though it's the same kind of regulation well, versus non-regulation conversation, but still a very different form of conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know me by now, <clears throat> we have known each other a couple, uh, a couple of years. And so my conclusion is, yeah, free and fair markets are always great. But Bitcoin itself is going to encounter, even in being self-regulating, the, the need to establish uh, both constitutive and regulative rules that will establish it as a free and fair market. So I actually, with my students, I, I contrast. I, I like talking about uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and, the, and all blockchain issues with my students because, because then I am the 85-year-old grandfather trying to set up an iPad. I don't <laughs> actually know anything about it. Right. But I can still show you that even though I don't know, the lenses actually the lenses that we study are powerful enough to give us some insights into what's going on. So if you look at those markets, unregulated markets in coin that have completely collapsed, Bitfinex uh, is one of them. There are various different examples that were manipulated by outside players because they essentially had no uh, information sharing. People were hiding their identity. Um, I think Bit Bitfinex is the one where the the very founders of the market founded another currency that they used to inflate the price of the original currency and they were manipulating yeah. that <laughs> yeah. market all around right yeah or you look at the problem encountered by ethereum in the moment where they had to do a hard fork because they had a hack from of the DAO. organization DAO. Yeah. Yeah. down right? the, 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 the first uh, completely decentralized autonomous uh, venture capitalist fund where people threw in millions yeah. of, of dollars into that fund and suddenly it was hacked uh, yeah yeah and so Ethereum right, has to do this hard fork. And then all of, a see, all of a sudden you see everybody in blockchain companies, everybody on the blockchains all around the country starting to talk about democratic theory. Now this actually warms the heart of a political scientist <laughs> because they're starting to talk about, hey, yeah. wait, 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 wait a minute. The way that this fork actually got voted in empowered these whales um, we didn't know that they're simply owning more of the coin uh, was also going to make them uh, dictators of the forks and et cetera. And other companies started to come up and say, we've got different models. Actually, we've got models that, uh, you know, that won't allow those traders to dominate uh, the eventual choice of regulation, because if you did, you'd end up in the situation that, uh, that we're in with depository trust and et cetera. If you, you allow self-regulation without any oversight at all, you, you're going to start to suspect that the major traders are just simply setting the rules to benefit themselves. So by positioning these examples, um, Bitcoin, um, Bitfinex, and Ethereum, and, and that governance problem that they encountered, by, by studying them all right next to each other, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's like, Everything old is new again. Look at that. Oh, Professor Kels, I feel like every time I talk to a political theorist or a law <laughs> professor or, or someone, I've, I, we've had um, a number of such interviews. So one is with we, you, the other it was with Professor Katarina Pistor, who is a Columbia law professor about her book, The Code of Capital. Uh, it was my... The first year when I was doing this podcast, I interviewed Professor Stefan Eich, who is now at Georgetown University teaching um, political theory and government. And he was a specialist at political theory of money. And he writes about John Locke sometimes as well. So, and when I talk to all of you, you are all very uh, skeptical. And I wouldn't use the word contrarian, but at least very critical, or, or at least you can spot out uh, the logical fallacies or inconsistencies in some of those structures. So uh, Professor Ike wrote the book, uh, Regulating Blockchain. Professor Pistor went on to Congress to testify against Facebook's uh, current uh, 
cryptocurrency Libra, and, and she was talking about how Facebook was basically printing money uh, themselves. And, and you right now are telling me how the new wave of Bitcoin that we're, we're, we're seeing, obviously, uh, seems to be this, uh, it, it will still not do away the essential political theoretical questions and implications that we have to address. Um, yes, I, I completely see what you're saying, but the, the, here's where the but comes in, is that the, the, most people don't care about that. They just need to ride the high yeah. and, and see the price go through the roof or, or come crashing down. And they, uh, they don't think it is necessary at all to mm-hmm. even think about any of those problems from a political theoretical perspective. In, in other words, uh, the, 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 the crime that Robin Hood has, has committed to us is simply a crime and they're all colluded colluding against us. Mm-hmm. The, the rise of Bitcoin is simply inevitable and, and such and so on. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, there's, a, there's a strange, uh, nearly um, social scientific, call it pseudo social scientific uh, perspective that political theorists sometimes uh, take. Uh, the other social scientists don't necessarily always want us into their, uh, in their club. Um, but one of the things you're pointing out here is that a political theorist will tend to take something like a social scientific uh, perspective, right? So there's, there happens to be a window over here in this room. So imagine, right? I, I keep on saying during this conversation, I'm kind of looking out the, a window from above at the behavior of people on a Robinhood app or on a Bitfinex uh, market and et cetera, and saying, gosh, look at the normatively loaded arguments uh, that they are making. If they could only see what I see, that from a neutral perspective on the outside, they are making normatively loaded arguments quite a bit like we have had before and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a weird detachment uh, that can sometimes uh, uh, be possible. It's not true of all political theorists. M- many political theorists define the field itself as an activist uh, field. Uh, I don't, I define it as, a, as an analytical um, and an ethical um, field, right? And, and all I could say in response to that is that little by little, um, um, talking to the people that we talk to, I'd love to give congressional testimony uh, about this, actually. Hey, so if there's anybody listening, I'm going to drop my digits below. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll put the thing on. <laughs> yeah. But through whoever it is that we get to talk to, uh, kind of defining for them the recurrent questions uh, within the liberal democratic structures that we operate by defining for them the recurrent questions and then telling them what the options are for taking ethical perspectives. I take this ethical perspective, my students often take others, even you know, endorsing as someone as opposite as Milton Friedman or endorsing Karl Marx, of course, right? Those are legitimate perspectives within the room that I was talking about earlier. So by, um, by helping students to, 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 to see what it is, that the question that is unfolding in front of them, to see its similarities and differences with previous question and to understand the ideological approaches that they can take. I, I take this thing to be chipping away one person at a time, one congressional committee at a time, one article at a time, one book at a time at sort of addressing those very people. Um, yeah, when I look out, on those things, you're absolutely right. They people mostly don't care if I was preaching them out a Juliet balcony or something like that. I'm like, here's how you should think about this ethically, uh, right? I see. Um, I see. I know I'd probably get an iPhone thrown at me, but <laughs> one by one, you know, illuminating these people about these perspectives. So, so since you were saying that the the old story is a new story, the new. St- the new story is an old story and the old story sometimes becomes new. And mm-hmm. I do want to ask you whether you are optimistic in, in any sense, because uh, I have a tendency to be somewhat pessimistic looking at all this, because mm-hmm. it seems to me that um, in this instance, we, we would, whether it's in Robin Hood or any of the cases we, we designed, it, if it takes human design to establish and regulate a market, it seems that we're bound to make some kind of flaws. We're, we're run into these oh, yeah. imperfect isn't that moral, ethical. Yeah. Isn't that great? We, great in the sense that we're, we're never 
solving this almost in some way. So um, yeah. yes, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. And which is that, that if, if you look at history, we've, we've gotten into so many problems, we've magically solved so many of those problems, but we're still in so many of the problems. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, in some sense, I, I, I was young and idealistic once, uh, or at least I was young. And I thought that going into political theory would provide more impetus towards solutions uh, uh, to the problems over the course of uh, time and in part under the, the influence of the um, Catholic thinkers uh, who I've read just as parts of my project, uh, let alone as parts of my sort of heritage. Um, I've come to think just, just to embrace the fallibility of, uh, of the human mind and therefore the fallibility of human ideologies. Um, we are always going to be uh, messed up uh, and misunderstand what it means to ethically treat each other. And the institutions that we uh, build will likely amplify our own flaws in some horrific ways. Uh, but it's kind of beautiful. Um, we, we keep on trying. I fear that I'm, I'm also an institutional thinker. I don't, I don't want you to think that, that I'm telling a story here about how you know, everything that happened to Diogenes is also happening to us. That's not the story of history I'm telling. We're in an institution, we're in an era of history where um, liberal democratic capitalist institutions um, have become, uh, you know, the structures were reinforced and institutional incentives were given and it's been a good long uh, run there here now of institutional stability. I am very, very afraid that things like the January 6th Capitol riot, the rejection from the sort of far right and the far left um, across the world of liberal democratic capitalist norms will actually destabilize the incentives of institutional players. So they'll actually start to um, dismantle um, what have been some very stable institutions, which have produced passively ethical results uh, over the course of time. So um, I'd label myself pessimistic on that front. Um, th the end is nigh. I see. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably not next week. Yeah. yeah. Um, so by the same token, by teaching people about the political theory of this institutional context and these ethical critiques that I talk about, I still think that there's some, uh, some way to uh, put, continue to put some more wind in the sails of this, of this overall institutional system and, and, and stretch out its historical moment a little, a little bit longer. I see. Um, okay, I guess the... I know we've been talking for, for more than two hours now, so we should probably wrap up soon. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I, I, I am wondering in this moment of time, when you look at what happened in the past 10 days or so, the, the dramatic rise of the Reddit traders, as well as mm. this collapse almost of, of you know, Robin Hood's vision of democratizing finance and, and all, mm. all that uh, good stuff. What do you think is the path going forward that you would ideally choose to do? So in other words, we, we go back to the original question, libertarian versus paternalistic, the libertarian one saying they should do whatever they want and the paternalistic saying consumer welfare, consumer welfare. Um, I know you, you've uh, uh, kind of shied away from making specific, um, I would say financial or technical response mm -hmm. in terms of how, how or policy response in terms of how we do, do this because we're not here to talk mm -hmm. about the nitty-gritty of finance but what do you see as the right way out from a political theoretical point of view i'm a, you know I'm, a, I'm afraid that my answer to that will will you know fly at thirty thousand feet again and and um and disappoint you but in in some sense just taking say one corner of, uh, of the problem, the, the, the difficulty could be in people's conceptualizations, right? That Robin Hood democratized trade is, is um, uh, Wall Street trade. So it sounds like, is, is that a slogan for them? It sounds like it could be a slogan for them. Uh, uh, yes, yes. 
uh, oh, the whole okay, spiel right. was uh, when when you go to an older brokerage firm like Fidelity or uh, Charles Schwab, you would have paid you know six ninety five for a trade or something. But if you come to yeah. Robinhood, it's zero commission yeah. trade. Yeah. So because otherwise I was going to say let's trademark it uh, and sell it to them. It sounds like a, a perfect sales line that they've democratized trade, but um, whatever democratize means, um, they really are just uh, an aggregator, um, they create a firm, they create a corporation, and they give you access to what a corporation has access to um, in the markets. And corporations are part of the market, but they don't rule everything. They can't do everything. They respond to what other corporations do. They need market makers, they need clearinghouses and all these sorts of things. And so I, I guess I would urge uh, people to realize that just because your your current urge to sell GameStop at 458, 462, 475 has been thwarted, does not mean that the project of democratizing the market, or the market, or your freedom, uh, has somehow gone up uh, in smoke. That's a bit of an overreaction. You now have much better access to what corporations have access to on the New York Stock Exchange and other uh, exchanges, celebrate that. But it's going to come with some limitations at certain times. I see. Because I do, wrapping back around two hours, I, 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 I actually 100% buy the, the CEO's uh, explanation that this is really just about uh, ability to make margin calls and they couldn't get further out over their skis um, by selling more of these positions, especially when they were financing these positions, because that meant they had to have cash on hand within, um, within their organization as well. I think this was really actually an appropriate response to this fears of the 2008 financial uh, meltdown. Robin Hood was way far out over its skis. Depository Trust properly uh, told them they had to do something to stop this. They acted as quick as they could to stay solvent to stop this. And now they have billions, uh, right? Um, it is a happy outcome do. In, in, in some sense. Yeah, I know a lot of people are going to disagree with that. If anybody's still listening two hours in, they can <laughs> personally send the Rotten Tomatoes to my email address. Um, <laughs> but that's my actual judgment. Academically, I'm more interested in all the different perspectives that people have. But I, I think this, that's really what happened. And, and I think it was appropriate on their part. I see. Uh, but Professor Kautz, it's been just a, you know, we, we've done this marathon. I don't know, do you, do you, is there anything else that you think our listeners should learn from you, from your wisdom today that, that we haven't really touched on? Uh, I know there's still other stuff that uh, we could talk about, I mean, including the right consumer protection and such and so on, but uh, I don't want to take too much time anymore. So anything else on your mind that, that you think we should, we should talk about? We run literally to the extent of my uh, knowledge. <laughs> took tw took twenty years to get this two hours and one minute uh, of uh, content, and that's pretty much it. I actually would say uh, instead that I keep uh, loading more into the memory banks by listening to the Policy Punchline uh, podcast and hearing what many colleagues uh, of mine from around the country uh, are saying. So let me just actually plug your work. Man, I wish I had done what you're doing in college. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had been, there had been the internet. I wish a lot of things, but um, you are providing an education uh, to many people. I, lo I laud you and your team as well for, for your efforts. Th thank you so much. I, uh, for our listeners uh, who, who are curious, Professor Kelts and I met at my residential college uh, dinner table. Yeah. So there's this, yeah, yeah. Uh, was it called uh, Maddie? Uh, so my, my residential college name is Maddie. So is, was it Maddie ethics table or something? It was like a, yeah. a Thursday yeah. night or Tuesday night. We, we, every week uh, we would go oh, because it's a free meal swipe or something. So I, I mean, it's like a free, yeah. a free meal for me. So I would, I would go. <laughs> yeah. uh, that wasn't the initial incentive, but it was, it was always great to, to be able to have some kind of uh, intimate conversation with great thinkers and, and just, but, but we never actually touched on too much political thought or, or too much political theory when we were debating. It was about, was sometimes yeah. about climate change, sometimes about uh, ethics, kind of all over the place. And, and uh, yeah. it, was, it was obviously great. And uh, I'm, I'm glad- It's funny, I'm we've been talking here on, on, this, uh, on this call, like we're two sort of uh, floating disconnected heads 
exactly. uh, containing intellects and quoting books and etc. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's funny at the end you get down to it. Uh, actually, is it? Yeah, we actually met because somebody offered us a free chicken alfredo, <laughs> and we sat around and basically shot the shit about things that were of importance to us. It's, this is the real story, people. <laughs> there were a, there were a group of students who would uh, attend uh, the the table every week, and it was it was great. We built a very small, nice intellectual community there, which we should send them the podcast to. So uh, it, yeah, it's yeah. great. Uh, but before you go, I always ask this. Uh, question at the end as, as you know what would be your punchline uh for this interview whether you know we, we talk about so many aspects whether the the game style broadman hood situation itself or john locke or, or uh, hardcore uh, anything what, what's on your mind what should be the punchline yeah to, to to plagiarize a famous uh author uh i would just say the markets will hold how's that the markets will hold i see markets will hold um, I don't love that. I'm not an ideologist of the markets, et cetera, et cetera. But everybody calm down. The markets will hold. And we're in charge of steering them towards the right outcomes from here on out. The markets will hold. I'm going to put that on a t-shirt, man. <laughs> the, the market, but, but, but don't, wouldn't one say that um, we, we, the, the technological breakthrough or, or political dis, discontent or whatever, it will eventually just bring us to a new frontier or disequilibrium or whatever. It would, it would just break everything up. And now it's yeah. just kind of the, the symptom bubbling, right? The symptom is bubbling and the disease yeah. is just getting worse and worse. Inequality, the discontent for, for establishment. I mean, what we saw was that they didn't care what you have to say as, a, as an expert from CNBC. They think you're in bed with them, right? They didn't care what the technical yeah. details was. They, it was all just this bigger vision and, and drawing simple correlations between all kinds of facts, uh, unrelated facts that, that are all kind of grouped under this big umbrella of, mm -hmm. of yeah, so, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, now the markets won't hold indefinitely, but- um, In the long run, we're all dead, we, so. Yeah, we can, yeah, yeah, in the long run, <laughs> we're all dead. But everybody can take a chill pill right now and most of what's going on is, is, uh, is explainable and, and, and critiquable as well all that inequality and it's if we were if we were podcasting on another topic i would tell you i'm deeply concerned about things like inequality um etc in, in all sorts of ways uh wage inequality wealth uh inequality a driving and motivating factor behind a lot of my life and my research is cultural inequality a lot of my work is with first gen and low income uh students uh, where I try to do whatever I can to leave a different world to the to the uh, to the people who come after us than the than the one that I uh, inherited. So cultural and income inequalities drive and motivate a lot of my actual uh, actions. But if we're just talking about topic of market re regulation as today, the markets will hold, things will be fine, and we need to steer them towards the outcomes that we want. Thank you so much, Professor Kautz. Wonderful conversation as always. How, how can people learn more about your work? How do they usually uh, learn more about, uh, should I provide an email or will I end up with Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, <laughs> sending me a thousand? <laughs> your, your, your Twitter, your website, uh, your, your writings, oh, yeah. how can people follow you basically? Uh, yeah, Twitter, at Twitter, just at Stephen Kautz. Perfect. It's a unique enough name, name that I'm basically at Stephen Kelts on every uh, yeah. <laughs> possible app. Kelts um, as in K-E-L-T-S. K-E-L-T-S. Uh, exactly. Uh, well, thank you so much, Professor Kelts. I really appreciate you, you joining me today. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Hey, really good to talk to you, Tiger. And thanks for inviting me on. Well, and this concludes this episode of po uh, Policy Punchline. And that, that was a, a wonderful discussion with Professor Stephen Kautz, who is uh, a, a lecturer at Princeton University Politics Department and University Center for Human Values. You may listen to that episode on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and your uh, platform of choosing. And please uh, continue to follow us on policypunchline.com and engage in those wonderful discussions. So uh, thank you so much for listening today. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University.
We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.